I know some of you are excited about today's message already. Be patient. Um, get the, is that a moan? That's, that's scary. Listen, I believe that the Lord wants us to learn patience. Uh, and I know that your mama told you not to pray for it. Uh, your mama was wrong. Uh, in fact, like, 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 some of you are like, how dare you talk about my mama that way? Listen, if God does not strengthen us through, I'm not, I'm not celebrating our going through difficult spaces, but I am telling you that if you don't go through dis- difficult spaces, you're going to end up not only not being patient, but being weak. And God molds us through the life that we walk through. He molds us into the person uh, that he desires for us to be. And so uh, it is imperative that we get this idea of patience down. Now, before, before I dive headlong into this, I want to I wanna just make, uh, I, I wanna make a statement uh, because I think it, part of my role is to encourage our community. And so I'm going to do that today. Y'all know there's an election coming up. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you voted already, but there won't be many of you, uh, probably more per capita in this room than in most rooms, because I, I I'm proud of several of you that have voted, but I know, that the, I know what I know, and know, what I know is that the attendance has been really bad so far. Um, and if I were, and I don't plan to run, okay, not that it would matter because I, I plan to be your pastor, but if uh, I were to run and be in public office and be in the, the, the public spotlight and get criticized on the regular from a, a vocal minority, I would want the average individual that was proud of uh, the service that I was providing to the community, um, I would want them to express that at the poll when it was time for me to get reelected or time uh, when I was seeking to go be elected. Does that make sense? And I can tell you that it's a bad sign if we don't vote and it's hard to be a good citizen and a good believer in Jesus Christ if you don't vote. We can have that sermon a different day of why it matters. Tuesday, 7 to 7, all right? I ain't telling you who to vote for. I'd like to, but I'm not going to do that today. I'm exhibiting self-control, but I have confidence that if my people, if God's people get out and, and, and express their freedom, uh, at the polls, it'll make a difference in our community. And, uh, so I encourage you to do that. All right. Now, uh, we're going to be in James chapter five, not in the first part of James. There's a whole part there where it says that he, he, he creates perseverance in our life as we go through struggle and, um, that patience is a part of that. But I want us to begin by thinking a moment about why patience matters. See, if, if we're walking through life and don't feel that life has a purpose, it creates a fundamental problem for us. See, if we don't ha- believe that life has a purpose, then all of a sudden everything's meaningless. At that point, cynicism and bitterness and resentment will come in and they will take root. Likely, as a result, you will become depressed and unproductive. Maybe unproductive at work, certainly unproductive in whatever the calling of God is in your life, and also very likely uh, not only not productive, but maybe not the participating part within a family that one ought to be, which makes it hard. It's hard if you're the teenager and mom and dad are trying to encourage you to be acting, do the things that you need to do to be able to adult well later. It makes it hard if you're a spouse. It makes it hard if you're literally, if you were trying to lead a, an individual like that in, in, the, in business, it's hard to run a team that way. Does this make sense? Because if we don't think life has a purpose, if we don't think that there is a, a viable ending to which things are moving, that we are a part of, it takes away the desire and the motivation, our willingness to get up every day and keep on keeping on, right? And so this idea of patience in this regard, is in large part being willing to look to God to give us strength to walk through things that we don't have control over. And that's hard. Amen? Okay, just, just check it. Like, that should be something that we agree on, that like waiting on things that we can't control is tough. And oftentimes, uh, it, is, it is a struggle because when we look and I want you to see this. When we talk about our faith, all of these things do dovetail. They connect. They're interwoven. And when we want to talk about strength of, of character and being able to be strong and to be courageous, to be able to be genuine and to be good, if, if there's not a belief that there's a purpose in this world's existence and that God is God of it, 
and that he cares about me and that he has a plan for my life and for your life and for your family and for our community, well, then it's going to be difficult to want me. You might want to be real, but you're not going to want to be real nice, right? Like, like you're not going to want to be good. Not necessarily. Like, why would you want to be good? There's, there's no person watching over. Like, there's no, there's no Godhead. There's no plan. There's just chaos. It's just moral chaos. As believers in Jesus Christ, let me point out that we believe that God has a plan for our lives, collectively and individually. And we believe it is a good plan. And that he's a good God. Why do we believe that? We believe that because of what he's revealed about himself. Now let me begin at the, the, the fundamentals of, of Christianity. We believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And that God sent him in flesh to show us that there is hope. To show us how much he loves us. And to give us a pathway to be with him eternally. And that on top of that, the present situation is not only not the end, the present place is not the ending place. Now, I know that that is startling to some that are not persons of faith, but the scriptures teach this throughout, right? And so for us to not grapple with these truths that should affect our everyday life and maybe in some ways acknowledge that they affect our everyday life, I think would be a little bit short-sighted. Right? And so when, when we fail to see God as in charge, our patience is going to tend to wane. When we fail to see his purpose and plan, our patience would tend to wane. When we, when we fail to see that God is a God of his word, our, t- our patience tends to weaken. And so I want you to look with me then at James chapter 5 as we look at what, well, the apostle James says to us uh, about patience and why it matters. And we'll look at Candidly, we're going to look at some more biblical illustrations along the way. I don't know that these have been the most fascinating illustrations that I've given in recent weeks, but we've literally been looking at Bible stories. This is what we've been doing. We've been using the Bible to explain the Bible and then trying, I've been trying my best to say, okay, now here's how some ways that this could apply at home with the kids. This is a way that this could apply in your life this week. But fundamentally, what we're talking about today, the idea of having faith, is trusting God when you are not in charge, you can't control the outcome, you've done what you can do, and now you have to wait. We want to be able to wait well. Don't you want to be able to wait well? Nod with me if you're with me. You want to wait well? We want to wait well. We're not asking God to torture us. Some of you are like, I'm already there. Um, and, and literally, if I, were, if I were coming out of as a loving parent, as a loving shepherd, to try to say to you, most of you, there, there are a few, we've got some folks, let me just point at the camera for a minute. We've got some folks walking, watching today that want to be here whose lives are kind of on the line. Like, 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 like you physically are struggling and you're wondering what the future looks like. I want you to know that God is with you and we love you. All right. And there's some of you here today that maybe, maybe you're here, you're present and you've received a diagnosis or there is an imminent issue that is truly persecution or truly like tragic suffering. But I'm just going to tell you, and I love every one of you, and I know that matters to you, but if you didn't make a team, you're not being persecuted in the name of Jesus Christ. If you didn't get the raise that you wanted, you're not being persecuted in the name. Like, like, and I'm saying this in, in a way that I don't want you to just tune me out because I know that you want to be encouraged that, that, you, that you're like as a result of our time together, like your life would be better. One of the things that I can do to encourage you is to tell you to, is to encourage you to, to scan out just a little bit because there are people around you that are dying. There are people in our world that, that are truly suffering for the name of Christ. Like I can say Jesus as many times this week as I choose to. Like now, I could probably get in trouble if I started naming who I was going to vote for this week. That would create some persecution, but it, we could debate whether or not it'd be just or unjust, okay? Like, I think I got more rights than I'm allowed to express without persecution. But that being said, like, nobody's going to come in here and tell us we can't worship. Like, we live in a, a very safe environment, right? We live in a very wealthy part of the world. 
And I make no mistake about it. There's some ways some things could be better. If, if elections turn out a certain direction, things could be financially better. All these kind of things. But hear me say this. We often struggle from not viewing our life as it really is. We look and, and we, victimize, we make victims out of ourselves, and that makes our circumstance worse. Am I making some sense? And I don't know if I should have gone that long to tell you, like, hey, look, sometimes you just got to gotta not believe what everybody's telling you around you about how bad off it is and make your comparisons about how horrible it is compared to everybody else that you see. Like you saw three people get what they wanted and you didn't get what you wanted, so now you're having a catastrophe and God is not good. That's not the same as this group of people here that were struggling to make ends meet because they, the very fact that they called Jesus Savior. They were struggling to even have a family because they'd been kicked out of their family because they had chosen Jesus over Hebrew religion. Does this make sense? So I want us to categorize just a little. But in James chapter 5, not categorize, I want us to put perspective on things. We are blessed. Like when you walk out, like be thankful. Do you see how this connects? A thankful heart is always going to have a better mindset and be more productive than one that's not. So let's make the list of the things that we can be thankful for to begin with. Now we find James chapter 5, again toward the end of the book, he's writing to a group of people that he uh, is wanting to encourage. There had been some, he's named in chapter 5 in the first part of it, that were, abused, that were wealthy, that were abusing their wealth. This is not the topic really for the day, but we're really talking about a group of people that in verse 7 that were poor, that were struggling. And they were struggling in a variety of ways, and he wants them to be encouraged, and he says this to them. He says, be patient. Therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See, he immediately puts it in the perspective that we are not in a chaotic world that has no ruler. We are in a, a world that is flawed, that is sin-marred, but has a Savior that is coming. And I'm not a guy that gets up here and talks every week about he, it's imminent. He's coming tomorrow. He's coming tomorrow. He's coming tomorrow. He is coming. I just know that I believe that. I believe that the scriptures say that we have a Savior that is going to return. I don't know when, but I have a very strong confidence because of what the scriptures teach that God is indeed in charge, that Jesus wins, and that he will return one day, and he will make all wrongs right, that he will bring vengeance upon those to whom vengeance is due. He will bring reward on those to whom reward is due. It probably will not turn out the way all of us think it might in terms of reward and judgment because I think many people don't see behind the scenes like none of us do of what's in the head and heart of so many. But God promises he will not be your debtor. He is going to make the wrongs right. He has promised his presence with us. And like, listen, this, a big chunk, like as I was reading in the commentaries about this very first part of the verse, the idea of his return, his coming, is the picture of his presence. Like, it's, it, it is, yes, that there's a, an ending coming of the current struggle. But part of it is, like, it, it's almost, y'all y'all remember, I, some of y'all can't relate to this because you, like, you may just have never had it, but, but I did. And I remember that I would wait in the front foyer for my dad to come home, like, every afternoon. And he would, he, he, he worked for the state. And so in, in, in those years, early years when I was little, he would come and I usually had Hot Wheels cars. Any of y'all ever have Hot Wheels cars? Yeah. All right, a few of you did. And I'd bang them and I'd do all kinds of stuff with them. Uh, and it was all fun. And, and, and we didn't have carpet there. Back then there was long, shaggy carpet everywhere, uh, but not in the foyer. And so I would hang out and play in the foyer and wait for dad to come home. And when he would come home, I'd wrap my arms around his legs. He had to carry an old briefcase. I mean, it was just, a, it, was a, it was a black, it was literally a black plastic briefcase that he had. I think, I don't know, maybe it was nylon, I don't know what it was, but it wasn't, it wasn't leather. It was just, and I try not to get hit by that, right? But I would wrap my arm, and he probably wanted a minute to compose himself, to be honest with you, but all I knew was daddy's home. I mean, it means it's playtime, it means we can, we can eat dinner now, because daddy's home, I want to be like dad, and I want to hang out with dad, and wherever dad is, I want to be there, and if I can be on him, I want to be on him, because he's dad. And if dad's at the car, we're going to hang out at the car and we're going to, well, he never cussed at the car, praise God. But, but he, he was unhappy with the car sometimes when we were fixing stuff. 
Uh, and if he wanted to build something, we'd build something. Maybe we'd get to go fishing. Maybe we'd get, I'm like, but dad's home. Everything's better because daddy's home. When it says here, be patient, brothers, until the coming of the Lord, part of what he's saying is, hang in and hang on because I'm coming. One day, I'm coming. And it won't be like, I promise, it'll be better when I get there. But it, I'm coming. And to know that he's coming. Believer, does that not resonate someplace? I know he's coming. Because he said he's coming. You're like, well, how can you believe him? Listen, our entire, the entirety of our faith is built on a trust that God is God and that he loves us and he trusts and, and that we should trust him. And if we have trusted our sin to him, then we should be able to trust that, that he will take care of us in the here and now, right? But there's always going to be these things that we don't understand. Well, he keeps going. He starts with this idea of return. And then he gives some examples. He says, see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it. Like he's waiting, not like not trying to be patient here with people. Hypomene, I'm not a Greek. Uh, I took plenty of Greek, but I'm not a, I'm not a, my language, even in the English is just real Southern. Okay. And so I have Southern United States, uh, very thick dialect, even in my Greek grammar. All right. Uh, but there's a Greek word here that talks about waiting in circumstances, not, not being patient on people, which is that probably ought to be macrothumia is another is another word it, it means long to anger maybe we ought to do that next week i don't know uh but long some of us could use some I, like i need a longer fuse anybody need a longer fuse well that's your word macrothumia i actually got that one a little better than the other one um but that's patience with people like you're like hey can i get a supplement of that like what what can i go to the health food store and buy some of that like honestly if i could give you some injections i'd like legally i'd probably figure out how to do that and bottle it because some of you could use it, man. I might even have your wife sneak it into your food somehow. I don't know. Um, the good news is, well, this may not be good news. I don't know how to do that. Like, there's no such thing, right? And so this example, though, is this picture of waiting well, being able to hang in and hang on despite the fact that circumstances are really stinky, right? And so what we have here is a reminder to think about the farmer. Now, I know some folks that are farmers, and I know some of you that know some people that are farmers, because some of you have kinfolks that are. But in Palestine, it seems backwards to me, right? And I'm not saying they're backwards. Maybe we're backwards. I don't know. But they would have to wait for the early rains and the late rains, and it describes that here. It says the farmer has to wait. Like, he does what he can do. Isn't that what the farmer does? He plants, he plows, he prepares, he puts the seed in, and then he waits. Can he control the waiting? Nope. A lot of it he can't control. He can anticipate some things that are going to come, right? If he's going to anticipate a certainly wet season or a particularly cold season or dry season, like they can do some things to mitigate some of that. But the farmer knows that a lot of what they do is an act of faith. They can't, they, they, they only can control what they can control. And so they have to wait. They wait and are patient. He says, being patient about it. Waiting for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rain. So the early rains would have been October, November. This is the backwards part. Don't y'all think Thanksgiving, season of harvest, pilgrims, <laughs> Indians, turkeys, all that good stuff? I know it might not be politically correct anymore, but it, it's part of our history, right? Well, that's not how they do it over there. Over there, the early rains would be in October, November. And then that would cause the seeds to germinate. And they don't have to have a lot of rain over there, by the way, to just make things turn beautiful. Like it's a fertile soil. But then in April, May, they, they have to wait for the later rains. And if they decided because they hadn't got the later rains, well, we're just going to dig up this plant and give up and just move off, go away, forget about it. They quit too soon. Because the later rains are what would make it do what it needed to do most. Like it would, it would help it, well, to be a good crop. There's certainly scads of examples where farmers these days know, they know what the peanut crop's going to be if they don't get enough rain. Like they know mid-season, like, oh, we've had too much rain or not enough rain. We need, we need if we get us another good rain, man, in about a month, we're going to have some, some good boiled peanuts. <laughs> Sorry, you have to listen to the earlier messages, but... 
Um, that's coming in the fall. Not the message, but the peanuts. <laughs> not to you, but collectively. Does that make sense? I, I don't, I, not unless I get a, a, a harvest of peanuts somewhere. But here's the point. He's telling them that sometimes you got to wait. Like it's a, natural, it's a natural part of life. You're like, oh, there's a waiting process. Like young lady, young man, I wish I could tell you that it's all going to be perfect by the end of the year. I can't tell you that. I can tell you that you're going to grind and you're going to grind and you're going to grind. And if somebody may have told you there's a quick way around it, you can get you a shot and it'll fix it. Um, or here's a way to fast forward or an end around. There's going to be consistent work involved doing what you can control. And then part of it's going to have to be waiting and letting the process take its place, but trusting God with the parts that you can't control. And God tells those, like, this is a message to us to be patient, just like the farmer has to be patient. Well, then he's going to continue on and he says to them, you also be patient. Just as the farmer is patient, you be patient. So it's a reminder. It's like he said it and then he gives them an example of it with the farmer and then he says it again. Then he says, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Now, this guy misinterpreted a whole generation. It's like, he's coming now. Like, they, they did. They thought he was coming immediately. And what we've determined over the years is we can't determine the day or the hour. The Bible actually tells us that. We can determine seasons. I, I, this is, maybe it's expedient. Call it what you want. He's closer to returning today than he's ever been. It's true. Is it going to be tomorrow? I don't know. I'm pretty sure that like the Thessalonians, he's not ready for us to sell everything we got and go wait on the hill and look to the east. I'm pretty sure that's not the, that's not the gig and then mooch off everybody else. That's not, no, we get the same letter. He write, Paul would write a new letter to the church at Emerald Coast Fellowship in Panama City. Hey, get back to work. Be busy. That's what he'd tell us. But he would also tell us to believe that the Lord is at hand. And so it's a reminder of the Lord's coming. Like his, so he's encouraged them a second time to be patient. And then a second time, to establish your hearts. The word establish, it, it means to strengthen, but it literally is this idea to confirm, to remind, to like, they say, I don't know if this is true. I haven't practiced this a ton. They say that psychologically, if you'll stand there and, and throw your shoulders back like this right here, then all of a sudden as a result of doing that right there for a certain number of seconds, I can make stronger decisions and be a little bit more firm in my resolve because I don't I look like a man. I don't know if that's true or not. We'll see if I get a little bolder right here. But here's the illustration. Maybe bad. I don't know. But, but, and I'm not telling you the psychology is true. What I am telling you is he says to confirm your strength. It literally is a word that means to prop up. Like, so we should take the word of God, what he's told us to be true. In the moments where we are weak, we should be reminding ourselves and one another that what God has said is right. That he's promised his presence would return. It's where you, honestly, you've got at times to allow people to tell you hard truths that you don't want to hear. Because if all you expect is for people to echo what negativity that you bring into the space, and they're like, and you're like, hey, but you know God's in charge, right? I'm not saying it doesn't make it hard. I'm not saying that I won't weep with you. I'm not saying that we can't carry it together. I'm not saying that it's not going to be difficult, unfathomably perhaps difficult for a period of time. But what I am saying is, all hope is not lost because Jesus is still the Savior. He's still returning. God is still on the throne. The Holy Spirit still empowers. And if we throw all of that away, well, then I can guess we can say we can have no hope, but we can't throw all that away. We just can't throw all that away. And so sometimes, like it doesn't say it in this text, but I'm telling you, there's plenty of texts, Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, stir up one another unto love and good works. It's this concept of propping one another up whenever one is not on their own strong enough to take the step forward. But I'm encouraging you today that one of the ways that we prop our own faith up and confirm our own faith is to be reminded of what God says. Because the world would tell you something different. The world would tell you don't trust anybody, especially don't trust God. The world would tell you that you, the only thing you can count on is the fact that it's going to go wrong. Only thing you can't count on is that people are crooked. Only thing you like, I need to stop saying those things because you're going to take that like, but God's word says that we can trust in him. 
And listen, some of you have been along for a pretty good, like you've had a pretty good go for a pretty good little while. Praise God. I'm so grateful. But there's going to come a long time. If you live long enough, there's going to come a long time that you get kicked in the teeth, you get kicked in the gut, and you just like, you lose your breath. Anybody ever had the breath knocked out of them? Oh, there's a lot of those. That's not fun. Like, you don't know if you're dead or alive. I mean, in that first, you're like, I mean, you just, you just, you just want a breath. I've had that happen. It's not fun. There are things that happen in life. We're talking real world now. You didn't just come in here and me, me give you the, the pretty colors that you wanted me to give you, that life is always easy, and if you just trust Jesus and pray on your way out uh, and pray this, then everything will be great. No, God's going to walk with you through everything, but there's some yucky stuff that happens along the way. And one win does not mean that it's all going to be cheery, because simply put, when we look in the Scripture, the testimony is different than that. In fact, we go on to the second example that he gives us. Well, we're not quite to the second example, but he tells us to prop up our hearts. The Lord's at hand. Then he says, don't grumble. Ooh. Ooh. You know what, Mo? Like, like, if you've ever grumbled, I'm not telling you it's okay. It's not okay. We shouldn't be grumblers. I've grumbled. You don't have to raise your hand if you're we're all guilty at some point of grumbling. Some of y'all are going to grumble this afternoon. I'm just encouraging your mama. Call them on it. No grumblers. Um. But Moses struggled with grumblers all the time. Like they'd have a victory and then grumbling. And then a victory and then grumbling. And then losses, 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 grumbling. And then a victory and then grumbling. Like they was grumbling all the way. Anytime it didn't go right, they'd be grumbling. And he never, like God was never for that. But it made it harder than it had to be. I'm just going to tell you, when you get in the, remember we talked about it at the beginning. Bitterness and resentment and all these things that start to, this good southern where they fester, right? Like get in, it infects. Well, over time, that's where grumbling, grumbling then starts in. And God says, don't do that. Prop your hearts up and don't grumble. He says, don't grumble against one another because that's how it happens. It's not grumbling against yourself. It's generally grumbling against one another so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. So it's not just the president of the Lord's coming. He's watching you too. Like, oh. So the one that's going to judge, like fix it, he, the judge is standing at the door. He's close. The judge is close. Not just the guy that's got your back, but the guy that also will hook you in the backside. He's close. Some of us don't remember that, and it shows. <laughs> I came up in a different world where they had a closet that coaches could go into with a paddle and another teacher. I never went into that closet. I was scared to death because the judge was at the door. <laughs> um, we need to be mindful that God does see. And it's encouragement to those that do right and to those that do wrong, that the judge is at hand. Right? It doesn't go unseen. We also... Look at the, at the second example. The first example is the farmer. Then he gives some advice in the middle. Then it says, as an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Now, it's interesting when we see that. He says, um, he says, behold, we consider those blessed that remain steadfast. And he's going to talk about Job in a minute. But before he gets to Job, he says, the prophets, they they being the Hebrew believers that had become Christians, they looked with great respect back at those that had followed before them. But we also know the history of the Old Testament is that they were maligned. They were mistreated. They were not treated well. And we see that in the Bible, uh, the, the, like, there's a, a regular reference to how hard it was for them to continue forward by faith in spite of the fact that it wasn't easy, Right? And so one example of that is in Hebrews chapter 11, where he, he speaks of, well, of judges and of um, great characters in the Old Testament, those that, that lived and saw great things of David and Samuel and Samson. And, but then he says, and the prophets. And what's interesting is that as he talks about, I mean, he mentions Daniel. So there's this mention in verse 33 of stopping the mouths of the lions and quenching the power of fire and escaping the edge of the sword and being made strong out of weakness. But then toward the end, 
we look and it says that um, others suffered mocking and flogging and chains and imprisonment. And it um, literally talks about them wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Although they were commended through their faith, they didn't receive what was promised. Since God had provided something better for us that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. Here's the point. They died never having received it. He's like, well, what hope is there in that if I don't get it now? Well, that's a lie that we've been told. I've got to have it now. That's not the promise. He may give you that. I mean, he's going to help you live with strength in the here and now. But health, wealth, and prosperity is not the promise of every person that lives faithfully for the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know if I need to say that again or not. Like, you, clean living does have its benefits. Don't get me wrong, right? But the fact of the matter is that we're not promised if we do it right that we're going to be blessed right now. That's not the promise. I mean, we'll be blessed in that we know we were obedient, but not in that circumstances were easy. And we see that with the prophets. Now, I'm going to give you uh, one example. And, the, and these are all being affirmed for how they were treated. If you look to the book of Jeremiah, and you look at Jeremiah 38, and I can't give you all of this. I'm going to give you a little bit of it, okay, because there's like several chapters of it. Jeremiah was mistreated most of his ministry. He just was. We never actually made it all the way to chapter 38. Uh, but in chapter 38, they still didn't like him because he still was telling an inconvenient truth. And there were still people that were saying, oh, it's all good. Don't worry about it. They're not coming to get us. They're not going to take over. And there is, there is Jeremiah listening to God's word and saying what God had told him to say, and they hated him for it. And so in the process of all that, well, they decided, they asked him for his his advice, and he was telling them that an army was going to rise up and it was going to be a problem. And so they threw him in an empty well, a cistern. And he sunk in, it says he sunk in the mud, and there wasn't any water, and they left him to die. Well, then things didn't go very well. And so they went back, the king privately went, they, he sent a group of guys to go put, it kind of talks about, I'm giving you the cliff notes. He, he, in, in Jeremiah 38, y'all, this is another one of those. It's good for guys to read this. I mean, ladies can read it too, but it's, it's a cool action story. Uh, and so they found some, cloth, some clothes. They put those things together. And on, they said, look, we're going to put this harness down there, put it up under your arms whenever he gets to the bottom, and we'll pull you out. And so he did, and they did, and they brought him back to the king. And the king says, listen, I need you to tell me how it's going to go. Don't you know Jeremiah was excited? Uh, okay, I can give you good news now. And you know what Jeremiah didn't do? He didn't say, you've mistreated me, so I'm not going to tell you the truth of God. I'm not doing it because you mistreated me. You know what he kept doing? He kept being faithful, right? Like it, it, it didn't get, and, and, and I'm not giving you like all the ending that you want. I mean, like he warned Zedekiah again, and then it ends up that his, he's taken care of until he's not, right? It went well for a little while until it didn't. And the point is that Jeremiah didn't stop being faithful. The call is not to be faithful as long as it goes well. Do you hear me? Like you accepted Christ a year ago, two years ago, and it went well for a little bit, and now it's gotten really hard and really blurry. So what do you do now that it's gotten really hard and little, little, really blurry? Well, James's commandment to us is to be patient and to be like the farmer that you sowed the seeds and, and, and they were watered and it germinated, but now we're in this dead time. And you've done what you can do that's within your control, and you're waiting. Well, how do you wait? Well, you continue to have faith, trusting that he will return. But even going so far as to say, if it doesn't turn out well in the short term, I'm going to trust him anyway. You're like, well, is that the common practice? I don't know that it's common, but it should be. It's literally what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego told, told the king before they got thrown into the fiery furnace, you're like, well, if they had faith, then they wouldn't have gone into the furnace. It's kind of not how that works. If you have faith, you don't go into the lion's den. It's kind of not how that works. If you have faith, like Jesus had faith, so then you won't be crucified. It's kind of not how that works. We got in our minds this idea that if we have faith, that it's going to be easy. It's not. What we've been promised is there going to be, there's going to be this middle space that's tough. One day, we may truly be persecuted, all right? But even in the here and now, in the moments that are not as pleasant as we would like for them to be, we should trust the Lord. I've got to keep rolling because it says in 
uh, to, to finish this text today and give you what, what I hope that you can practice this week in being patient. But he says at the end of the text, consider those ble- behold, we consider those blessed that remained steadfast. They, they continued to have faith. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, literally the strength and the courage of Job to remain faithful in spite of. And you have seen, he says, the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Now, why would they say that to Job? Because the Bible literally does tell us that in the end, after all that he went through, that things were better in the end than they were in the beginning, which is hard to fathom considering all he lost, including family, in addition to wealth, etc. One of the verses that I really think would be great for some of you to have like to hold on to, would be Job chapter 42, verse 5 and 6, where Job says this, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Why does that matter? Well, number one, it's because even in the middle of his tremendous difficulty, he could trust the Lord. But here's what's important what I think is exceedingly important here, had it not been for the struggle, Job's faith would not have been strengthened to the place that he saw God in a new light and in a better light than he did before. Like his, his faith in God grew stronger, not weaker, because of the journey. God makes us stronger through hard things. He makes us have faith that is more resilient as we walk through hard places. And if you need to look at the glass half full, what you need to know is that those going through difficult things can be getting stronger day by day by day if if we're like the farmer and if we're like the prophets and if we're like Job and that we are waiting well and trusting God with the things that we cannot control. Because literally it all revolves around faith. Faith is not, I don't even think it's faith if we can control it. If you know that you're in charge of how it turns out, all you're doing is trusting yourself. You're not trusting God. Trusting God is trusting Him in the, with the things that are beyond your ability to fix. With, beyond your ability to make happen right now. And so it is faith that allows us to be strong and courageous when we can't see how it's going to turn out, and to be patient even in the waiting, to plant though we know that we're not going to see it for a while, and to continue forward even when it looks like it may not happen this side of heaven. I want to close, and I'm past time. Shocker. I have limits. I do think about our nursery people in our Bible study classes. I want y'all to stand up with me, okay? If you've never chosen Christ, listen, that's where the, if there's a secret sauce, and there's really not a secret sauce, but if there's something that makes the difference of all the world, it's trusting your life to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. But as believers, as we seek to practice, um, I don't think that we get heavily persecuted, but some of you, there are some of you going through some really hard stuff. And I want to read a passage. I like to do that periodic. I want to read a passage over you as we close as a prayer. Um, It's 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 through 11. He's writing to a people that were persecuted. And he says, humble yourselves, therefore, God God in heaven, I pray that this this could be our prayer. Lord, that you would allow us to, to not be prideful, but humble ourselves before your mighty hand. Lord, that at the right time that you may exalt these, your people. Lord, we cast all anxieties on you, like our fears, our worries, the things that we we have a, a predicted ending to them, though they haven't occurred yet, which is not right or fair to you because you are God and you are in charge. And so we cast our anxieties on you, knowing that you care for us. And Lord, we seek to be clear minded based on the scripture and to be watchful. And we know that the enemy brings lies and prowls around and we choose to resist him and to be firm, to allow our faith to be strengthened and established and propped up, knowing that the same kind of sufferings that are being experienced today have been experienced by others throughout history and throughout the world. And Lord, 
after we have suffered a little while, we pray that the God of all grace that has called us into eternal glory in Christ, Lord, we pray that that same God would restore us and confirm us and strengthen us and establish us. Lord, to you and to you alone, be all glory and dominion forever and forever. We trust you. By faith, we walk forward and we pray that you would help us when we must wait. Lord, help us to wait well. We ask these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said,